Again, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming to the Farm Bill Seminar. Um, my name is Mitch Hunter. I'm a PhD student here in the Plant Science Department, studying agronomy, working with Dr. Dave Mortensen. Um, I do research out at the Agronomy uh, Rock Springs Research Farm on the Cover Crop Cocktails Project. I also TA the Plant Ecology course. Um, and I'm really happy to be here today um, to have a chance to share all my thoughts with all of you um, on the 2014 Farm Bill and how we got here and, and hopefully some lessons about um, how scientists can engage with policy. So um, why am I standing here today? Um, what brings me here? Well, it all starts about 10 years ago on the Desert Cattle Ranch in Eastern California. And the goal of this ranch was to manage the herd so that both the cows and the ecosystem could benefit. It was a simple concept. I thought it was very powerful. I was really committed to it. Um, but in the course of working there, um, I loved what I was doing, but I decided I could have a bigger impact if I could influence policy and spread these kind of ideas across the landscape, across the United States. So from then forward, I was really, really focused on policy. I went to DC, did an internship in the Senate. Um, I got a degree in political science. I wrote my senior thesis about the 2008 Farm Bill, so the last go around. Um, and after college, I moved down to DC and I worked for a group called American Farmland Trust, which is a small nonprofit organization. It's been around for about 30 years, working on conservation policy in the Farm Bill and in, in other areas. So I had achieved my goal. You know, I, I got a degree and I actually was working in the field that I had prepared for. Uh, which is not so common these days, I don't think. Um, and I, you know, was working on conservation policy in the federal. Well, it, it was good and it was interesting and I learned a ton. But I realized fairly quickly that uh, um, policy and I just weren't a great fit. Not a knock on policy, just it didn't work that well. Um, and I decided that in the long term, I could have uh, a, a bigger impact. Um, and hopefully, you know, a more lasting impact by coming to a place like Penn State and helping to advance the science of ecological agriculture. Part of it was that I'm basically a perfectionist and policy is really messy. So it just, it just didn't work that well. Um, so with that said, you know, I'm, I'm firmly here, I'm firmly doing science, but I just want to put up one small disclaimer. No data were harmed in the making of this talk. So don't expect this to be a research talk. Don't ask me about statistics. Um, this is just my perspectives and, and some thoughts after a few years of working in this area. All right, so um, <clears throat> I just want to quickly go over some goals for the talk. Uh, first goal is to give you an overview of, of how we got here, where we are with the Farm Bill. Second goal is to describe three policymaking principles that I think are important for everyone to understand if you're interested in engaging with policy. Um, third, three scientist strategies that people like us in this room can use to help influence policy. And finally, I want a lot of back and forth discussion. I'm going to be asking for audience participation. So if I ask you to raise your hand, I expect you to raise your hand if you agree with me. Um, and I'm hoping for lots of questions and thoughts to come out both throughout the talk and at the end. So I want to end early and have lots of opportunity for discussion. All right, so here's the first opportunity for audience participation, the timeline. Who knows, coming in here today, that as of two weeks ago, we have a new farm bill? All right, good. We got a lot of people who know about the new farm bill. Second question, who knows, who thinks they know when this farm bill was supposed to pass for the first time? Rachel had her hand up first, so. 2012, it was right there on my flyers, so it'd be hard to miss. <laughs> um, but Rachel's right, this was the 2012 farm bill originally. And what happened is that we've, we've, we've been delayed and delayed and delayed. So now it's 2014 and we finally have a farm bill. So I just want to walk you through a bit of that timeline. It will be a little bit of a whirlwind, but the point is simply to understand just how hard this farm bill was. And many people have said this is the hardest farm bill that we've ever gone through. So I just want to illustrate that. Okay, so again, we started back in the summer of, of 2010. We were trying to get the bill done by 2012 because the old farm bill was about to expire at the end of 2012. So we start with hearings, which is very common for policymaking. You go out, you ask farmers and other experts what needs to change in federal farm policy. Um, so both the House and the Senate had hearings in 2010 
in 2011. But the real action started on the Farm Bill at the end of 2011 with something that was called the Super Committee. And I don't know how many people in here were following these things closely enough to remember the Super Committee, but basically uh, Congress was having trouble resolving the, the, the debt and the deficit, and they said, here, you guys, you 12 people, you figure it out and bring us something and we'll vote on it. Um, and in this process, the Super Committee asked all the other committees to come up with, well, what would you do for agriculture? What would you do for energy or whatever their, their area was? And the Ag Committees were the only ones who actually took this seriously, worked together, House and the Senate, which was Republicans and Democrats, um, and came up with a compromise farm bill. And it was, it was um, with some input from advocates like uh, my old organization, but mostly written behind closed doors because they had to do it you know, in a few months. And it was pretty amazing what they got done in those few months. So they put together an entire farm bill, they gave it to the super committee, but uh, as you may guess, our debt and deficit problems aren't solved. The super committee failed. So we didn't get a farm bill at the end of 2011, but we did have a nice rough draft to work from going forward. All right, so we go into 2012, and working off this nice rough draft, the Senate passes the farm bill in the middle of 2012. Um, but unfortunately, House can't pass it. There's too much division internally within the, the Republican leadership in the House. Um, in terms of how much to cut, how to reshape farm policy. Obviously, they don't, didn't agree that much with the Democrats either, so the House couldn't move forward. Um, and what happened is at the very end of, of 2012, last minute deal, December 31st, um, there was a backroom deal cut to extend the farm bill for a year. So we still have a farm bill, we still have some farm policy. It's basically the same as it was with a few minor changes. So we're into 2013. And again, the Senate, using this template, is able to pass a bill relatively early in the year. So the House is going to follow suit. They bring the bill up, and it fails. And a farm bill hasn't failed in the House for 40 years. So this was a pretty historic event. The, the House was unable to pass the farm bill. And again, you've got this big split between Republicans who may have rural constituents, who may be really supportive of agriculture, and Republicans who are really concerned about the deficit and the debt and really want to make big cuts to these programs, which spend taxpayer dollars. So um, what they did is they said, let's take the ag stuff and put it over here. And we'll take the nutrition food stamp stuff and we'll put it over here, two separate bills. And we can pass both of those independently because we can make you know, some, some additional cuts to the food stamp bill, some additional changes to the farm part of it, and we'll pass those two bills. So eventually the House split the bill, but they're able to pass it. And this allows the House and the Senate to come together in a conference committee, which is where the House Ag Committee and the Senate Ag Committee meet. They try to work out their differences, come up with a compromise, so that the two houses can pass the exact same language, which was what needs to happen for the president to sign a bill. So we're in the conference committee, um, working through the end of last year. It looks like we're coming close to a compromise. They don't quite make the deadline, so we hit 2014. But pretty quickly, there's a, there's a conference compromise. And the House passes it, the Senate passes it, and Barack Obama gets to sign it. So <laughs> two weeks ago, we end up and we finally have a farm bill. And it's the 2014 farm bill, so it's a couple years late. But we got it done. Um, and to me, this incredible process that we've gone through, this four years of people's lives, hundreds of people worked on this bill for four years of their lives. And this really uh, points to me to the question, why was it so hard? And the big answer to that question of why it's so hard is the budget. Budget, budget, budget. That was the whole context for this farm bill. So you, we already talked about the super committee. They were put together to help deal with the debt and the debt ceiling. In 2012, Congressman Paul Ryan put together his budget, call, called for big cuts across the board, um, really big cuts in agriculture. The Tea Party is making their presence known, demanding a reform of the federal spending. And the fiscal, you know, we're entering the era of fiscal cliffs. So this whole background about the budget and how much we spend really colored the farm bill debate. And as you can imagine, it gets a lot harder to pass a bill uh, when you're cutting than when you're spending new money. Because when you're cutting, you're inevitably going to make people mad. So uh, when you make people mad, it's much harder to get to compromise. And this has a lot to do with why it took us so darn long to get our farm bill done. All right, so if it took four years, if, if hundreds of people spent four years of their lives, if we had to overcome all these obstacles, this again begs the question, 
why do we even pass a farm bill? And so here's more audience participation. Anybody got an idea? Why do we pass a farm bill? I'm serious. I'm going to wait until somebody answers. <laughs> yeah, Doug. Food security. Food security. OK, we need to grow enough food to feed the population. That's a good answer. Anybody else? Yeah. Standards. Standards for? Growing standards, <clears throat> cultivation standards. Right. Some guidelines for farmers about how to produce crops. Um, any other guesses? Ensure some degree of food sovereignty for folks on the low end. Right. Uh, that's right. Helping people who can't afford enough food from their families, getting that, get that food. So not everybody knows this, but the food stamp <laughs> program, which is now technically referred to as SNAP, that is a big part of the Farm Bill. OK, so these are three things that the Farm Bill does. But I would argue that that's not why we passed the Farm Bill. So can anybody think maybe a little more creatively about why it is that we actively, every five years, we go through this terrible process and pass the Farm Bill? OK. Subsidies for growers. Yetkin? Uh, if you don't pass it, I think it goes back to like, all the regulations, like the Nike version, selling them. Yes. That, that just gets messed up. That is very true. If you don't pass it, then you revert to weird regulations from the 1930s, 1940s. There's one bigger picture answer. Resources. Allocate resources. These are all excellent answers. But I would argue that the real reason we pass the Farm Bill every five years is because members of Congress want to get reelected. It's all about reelection. <laughs> and this is not uh, a snide criticism of Congress. This is simply a statement of fact that describes a process. So I don't want this to come across as uh, some activist -y statement. This is just this is a political science type statement. It's actually one of the key tenets of political science. Comes out of a work by David Mayhew, 1974, called Congress, the Electoral Connection. And what Mayhew did is he imagined, well, how would members of Congress act if their only motivation was re-election? And it turned out that they would act pretty much exactly the way they act in real life. So it's a pretty good approximation to say that members of Congress act in their electoral self-interest. Um, this is kind of like a duh thing. Like everybody knows oh, members of Congress act to get reelected, but I think it's, it's useful to zero in on it as the mechanism to understand what happens in DC. So this reminds me of a quote that um, many of you might be familiar with from Theodosius Dobzhansky, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And so with that, I'll propose my first policymaking principle, stealing from Dobzhansky, Nothing in policymaking makes sense except in the light of re-election. So I'll be building up three policymaking principles. That's number one. Try to, try to keep that in mind as we go along. OK. <clears throat> so why is this important? Why is it important to understand the electoral connection? And to me, it comes back to all the many steps that it takes for an idea to become a law. Now, I don't know what cultural range in terms of when you grew up this, this is still relevant, but some of you might remember Bill from Schoolhouse Rock, how a bill becomes a law. Well, you can just forget about Bill, because he makes it look way, way too easy. Um, so I just want to give you an idea of all the steps that it takes for an idea to become a law. There are countless, countless steps. I can't even begin to list them all. Something as simple as getting someone on the Hill to read your email and maybe respond to your email. That's a big step. Um, taking a meeting with you, an even bigger step, You know, listening to your ideas, learning about the issue, spending their time educating themselves, talking to their own constituents. All of these are challenges, uh, much less getting somebody who will actually support you and go around the hill to their colleagues and get more people to support you. That's even harder. Um, drafting language, that takes a lot of time. Another big leap. Actually proposing language. Now you have a bill, but it took you half a dozen steps to get there, if not more. And then from there, fighting for the, for the language, trying to push it forward eventually voting for it, putting up an amendment, making a speech on the floor. All those steps are take up members of Congress time and their staff's time. These are very busy people. So at each of those steps, how do you get that to happen? Well, sometimes you're lucky, and sometimes that member of Congress is so committed to your issue that they want to help, they want to do it. But these members face hundreds of issues every year, and they maybe have a handful that they really care that much about. So most of the time, you make that happen as an advocate in DC by drawing this electoral connection. You show them that helping you 
is going to be good for their reelection. And that's how you get it done to move them through all those steps to turn your idea as an advocate into, into some policy. So, uh, you know, a little more context for this, the 2014 Farm Bill, 959 pages, 456 sections by my very quick count through the bill. And on many of those sections, not all of them by any means, but on many of those sections, there might be 10 or 20 groups influencing that one piece of policy. So you're fighting with 10 or 20 other groups over one very small piece of policy, and you're trying to convince members of Congress that it's in their interest to help you instead of helping somebody else. And that is just really, really hard. And that is why it's really important to keep this policymaking principle in mind, that the currency on the Hill, what gets things done, is showing some kind of electoral connection. That might be showing them that the voters in their district care about this. It might be showing them that donors who have a lot of money care about this. It might be showing them that, that their party, which supports them in many ways with, with uh, committee appointments and with re-election funds, that the party cares about this. So there's multiple avenues to make this connection, but making that connection is absolutely key. OK, so how does this go down in reality? Um, I just want to tell you a story from my time in DC to illustrate how this can happen. And this is around something called conservation compliance, um, which some people are probably familiar with, but it's a pretty uh, nuanced concept. So I'll try to break it down. This was enacted in the 85 Farm Bill, incidentally passed the same year that I was born. And in the 1985, uh, there was a lot of concern about soil erosion and about loss of wetlands uh, through conversion to agriculture and all of the habitat losses and other environmental benefits that you lose when that happens. So in the 85 Farm Bill, uh, forces aligned and they were able to put in some basic provisions to try to stop um, erosion and wetland loss from happening. And these were structured as incentives, not requirements. So the two provisions are, one, you have to control erosion on your highly erodible land. So if you have sloping ground, you have to do strip cropping or terracing or no-till, some of those technologies that help you control erosion. And you have to refrain from converting your wetlands to agricultural production. So if you've got a, a beautiful wetland on your farm, um, you need to leave it there instead of draining it and taking advantage of that, the, that nice, you know, high carbon soil. Um, and the way this has worked has basically been, oh, first, this has been very effective, very effective. So since uh, the bill was put in place in 85 and overall erosion has, has really dropped since then, and at the same time, net, farm land, net um, losses of wetlands on farms have, have basically disappeared. Accord these are USDA numbers, they're disputed by, by different people out there, but according to USDA numbers, these two provisions have been very effective. So the way they've worked has been simple. If you're, if you're practicing erosion control and if you're you know, leaving your wetlands healthy, then you get your subsidies. And the, the big one, the big hook has been direct payments. Um, and I'll explain that more in, in just one second. But if you aren't doing these things, if you're allowing erosion to happen, if you're converting wetlands to crop production, then you don't get your direct payments. So you can go on doing that. You can pave your wetlands if you want to. There's going to be no, you know, the USDA at least isn't going to come ding you for that. But USDA will stop giving you your, your farm subsidies if you do that. Um, and these direct payments are really important to understand. These are kind of, at least over the past five years when we've had high prices, these have been the key farm subsidy. It's about $5 billion a year. It goes out to farmers no matter what. And the idea is that when they, when they put it into place, the idea was to give farmers flexibility. So no matter what you plant, uh, if, you know, no matter if you plant anything at all, no matter if you're profitable or not, these payments would go out to you. And if you can re imagine, thinking back to this budget, budget, budget climate, these subsidies were really hard to defend. I mean, it's money for nothing, right? You don't have to, you don't have to farm. Uh, if, you're, if you had a bumper crop, you still got this money. So it was really hard to defend these subsidies. So from early on, from that very first super committee document that was put forth, we knew these were going away. And as conservationists, we saw that. And, you know, we, uh, we, and, and we saw the writing on the wall that the new safety net was going, to be cons was going to consist of crop insurance. So crop insurance is just a different way of helping farmers with the ups and downs of farming. And it basically works like any other insurance policy. A farmer would buy, buy a policy for their crop. If the crop fails, they get a payment. 
The big difference is that uh, it would be very expensive for a farmer to buy this on their own. So the federal government subsidizes those policies on average about 60%. So the government, us taxpayers, we pay over half of these subsidies. Sorry, we pay, our subsidies pay over half of the cost of the policy. And just kind of by an accident of history, um, crop insurance subsidies were not tied to conservation compliance. So if you're a good, good conservationist, you got your subsidies. If you're a bad conservationist, you didn't get your subsidies. Or you still got your subsidies. Sorry. Either way, no matter, you didn't have to follow these two basic provisions, and you still got your subsidies. So this was a big problem for us as conservationists if the new farm safety net, if direct payments go away and the new safety net is crop insurance, where's the hook? What's going to get farmers to continue following these basic provisions that have been effective over decades? They've been around as long as I've been alive doing good on the landscape. We, we could lose, those, we could lose those, um, those two provisions. So I just want to poll you guys again. I mean, do you think that this is a problem? Raise your hand if you think this is a problem. All right, good. A lot of people in the room think it's a problem. Yes, this is a problem. Um, I'll tell you the answer. And we all thought the same, and the conservation groups banded together and had meetings and briefings and wrote white papers and made pie charts and just pulled out all the stops to try to make the case that this needed to happen, that we needed to have a linkage between these two basic provisions and crop insurance, the heart of the new safety net. And yet, after months and even years of working on this, we were getting nowhere. We got very, very little traction on the Hill. Sure, there were a few people, uh, you know, died in the wool uh, environmentalist conservation, so we could have gone to them. But we couldn't get anybody in the middle, anybody who was going to be able to broker a compromise to help us push this issue. They would meet with us and talk to us. We could get nobody of that kind to come forward and help us put, put out a letter saying, I support this, you colleagues should support it too. Just no uptake. So why is that? That's a really... I think that's a really important question to think about. Almost everybody in this room thinks this is a problem, right? We thought it was a big problem. We had facts and figures to back it up, but nothing was happening. And so this brings me to my second policymaking principle, which is that real world problems are not necessarily political problems. Just because you and I can decide, hey, this is a big problem, does not mean that Congress is going to respond to that problem and try to fix it. Yes, Congress is around to fix problems, but I would argue that predominantly they're around to fix political problems. Sometimes those align and sometimes they don't. And in this case, we had identified a real world problem. We might have more erosion, we might lose more wetlands. And we were not able to turn it into a political problem for various reasons. So many of the agricultural groups were not so keen on it, not so keen on it didn't want additional requirements on crop insurance. And so what this did is to members of Congress they were torn between uh, conservation constituents and agricultural constituents. And when you're in that situation, your goal isn't to you know, solve this problem. Your goal is to just be noncommittal and not vote. You know, those members of Congress didn't want them to, this to come up for a vote because if it came up for a vote, they would have to show us which side they were on. And they didn't want that. Perfect, perfectly logical if you understand their motivation as, as being reelected. So um, this, is where, uh, this is where policymaking gets crazy. So in the first time the Senate debated the Farm Bill, the summer of 2012, you know, I had, I had actually just left my job. I didn't have high hopes for compliance happening. Um, they're in this Farm Bill debate, and out of the blue, no warning to any conservation group as far as I know, Senator Saxby Chambliss from Georgia puts forward a conservation compliance amendment tying it to crop insurance, the very thing that we had fought and fought and fought for months to get. He pulls it out of nowhere and puts it forward. And he does it to spite the leadership of the Senate Ag Committee. Senator Stabenow and Senator Roberts, because they're northerners, they're from Michigan and Kansas, they care about you know, corn and soybean and wheat. He's a southerner, he likes you know, cotton, peanuts, and rice, and he feels like they were unfair. The Senate Farm Bill was all about those northern crops and not helping the southerners nearly enough. So he puts forward this provision that he may or may not even agree with. If he does, he's not a big supporter. But he does it to try to either bring down the bill or have something in the final bill that he can trade off later. That he can say, okay, fine, I'll withdraw my amendment, we'll get rid of that thing you don't like if you give me X. So after months and months of committed, dedicated work trying to turn this into a problem, uh, a, a problem that Congress wanted to deal with, nothing, and in one fell swoop, 
for pure politics, it comes forward. And the story has a happy ending, so this really broke everything wide open. Um, it showed who was on our side. It actually passed in that first Senate Farm Bill, even though we couldn't you know, get a lot of people to support it. Before then, the thing passed, and eventually the Aggie groups came on board. They said, okay, it makes sense. You've convinced us that it won't be a big deal, and we want to protect crop insurance. So fast forward, um, and we're in a situation where things are as they should be. If you practice conservation, you get your crop insurance subsidies. If you don't practice this basic conservation, you can't. And um, if you still want crop insurance, you can buy it. You just are going to pay the whole cost yourself, and you won't get help from the taxpayer. So you know, this is a big victory, right? And it was. It really was on the substance of things. But I can imagine that some people in this audience are thinking something's still not quite right. So in those four years, the facts didn't change. The importance of erosion didn't change. The importance of wetlands didn't change. And yet the outcome changed. So why can't facts speak for themselves in these policy debates more, you know, more strongly? Have, why can't facts have a louder voice? I think that's something that a lot of scientists would like to see. Um, so why doesn't policy respond to facts? You know, we'd like it to be this way. OK, you, you develop some facts, well supported by scientific evidence and the policy responds um, you know, to, to accommodate those facts or to address that issue. That's just simply not how it works. Um, facts are important. So you start out with facts, and um, maybe you add some beliefs, because let's be honest, rarely does a fact on its own tell you exactly what the policy response should be. So some facts and some beliefs, you can turn those into arguments. Uh, if you add advocates to the mix who can be representatives of voters or donors, um, they can take those arguments to the Hill and build congressional support. So even that is a huge heavy lift, but facts can play an important role in it. If you've got congressional support, you've got to build more, you've got to you know, find, uh, wait for the right time to come around. So you, there's a lot of time spent, tons of hard work, probably a good dose of dumb luck in there somewhere. And then finally, maybe if you're lucky, you'll have an impact on policy. So facts alone are just not sufficient. Facts need friends. Facts need somebody to carry those facts forward and turn them from a real world problem into a political problem. So again, this policy making principle number two is that real world problems are not necessarily political problems that Congress will deal with. They need to be massaged and developed. They need to be connected to voters or donors and turned into a political problem before they'll be acted on. Here's my third point about policy making. It's very fickle. So another illustration from the Farm Bill. Um, less than a year ago, we were in a position where the, the Senate had cut $4 billion out of SNAP, which is food stamps program, and the House had cut $40 billion. This is a huge gulf. This is not just something where you split the difference and call it good. The Senate was not going to budge from four. Didn't look like the House was going to budge from 40. And I was ready to write off the Farm Bill as dead because of this, this situation right here. And yet we're sitting here, we've got a farm bill passed. So what happened? Well, you might remember that last fall there was the government shutdown in DC. Um, uh, federal workers were furloughed for a couple of weeks. And what this did, totally disconnected from the farm bill, not part of farm policy at all, but what this did is it gave Speaker John Boehner, the leader of the House Republicans, a ton of leverage over his Tea Party members, the folks who had been really adamant about wanting to shut down the government, who had pushed it forward. It gave him leverage to say, that didn't work out so well for us. There was a big backlash from that for us. So we don't necessarily want to do that again. So looking at the farm bill, they could have stood their ground at 40 billions of cuts. No farm bill. But because of this totally exterior thing, this totally unpredictable thing that nobody really planned, this government shutdown, all of a sudden Boehner has the leverage and he tells his members, this time we're going to compromise. We're going to pass this farm bill. We don't want another situation where the public is blaming us or something not happening. So how do you deal with that in policy making? How do you deal with that as a scientist who's interested in policy? It's really hard. And this kind of unpredictability was definitely a part of why I decided that policy making and I weren't right for each other. Um, and it also, I think, is one of the hardest things to understand from outside DC. And, and it leads me to my third policy making principle, which is that if you want to be effective in policy, you have to play the long game. 
you can't expect to have some new discovery, new idea, and show up in DC and, and get it done in a year or two years or three years. You need to just stick around. And you, not to say you have to be there, but you have to have your hand in the game for a long time. Because as these forces constantly change, unpredictably change, with every election or some chance event like a government shutdown, um, it's, the conditions will be wrong for a long time, but every once in a while the conditions might be right. And the only way to be there when the conditions are right is to just stick around and, and, and be there for a very long time and have the relationships with people on the Hill or with advocates in DC so that when the stars align you can go make something happen. All right, so with that in mind, I'm going to jump forward to my scientist strategies. So these are uh, hopefully specific things that we all can use as we think about how our science um, can influence policy. So the first one is something that I think many of us do, especially in environmentally related science, is to define a real world problem. So that's, you know, establishing those facts that yes, go through a long process, but eventually are important in influencing policy. If you can define a real world problem, show something that's going wrong out there on the landscape, in society, what have you, then that can be a powerful tool, powerful ammunition for advocates to um, come to the Hill and say, we need, to, we need to make a policy change. And remember, it won't be automatic. Um, it'll be a long process, and there's certainly no guarantee of success. But this is a, a key prerequisite for getting something done. And as a scientist, you can decide whether you want to you know, be part of the advocacy process and go down to DC and talk to people and link up with uh, you know, nonprofit groups. Um, or you can decide to say, I'm just doing my science, I'm putting it out there, and hopefully it's getting into the right people's hands. And that's really just a personal choice for what you're comfortable with. OK, so that's strategy number one. Strategy number two is to position yourself to solve a political problem. So you take a real world problem, like uh, you know, water quality in the Chesapeake Bay. Scientists already did number one and helped define it. But there's also a management side of it. How do you solve that problem? So if you're the person who knows how to clean up the water, or in another context, if you're the person who knows how to save this species because you've studied them, and you have good relationships with policymakers, either people in DC, people on the Hill, maybe an agency person who's not writing policy, they're just implementing it. If you're the person that they want to call when they've got to solve this problem, you can be very influential about the strategy used to solve it. So that's strategy number two. If you have expertise on the management side and you build relationships with people who are putting policy into place, Again, you can be very influential. And the final strategy, which I think scientists don't think about as much, which is particularly relevant to ag science, I think, <clears throat> is that scientists can change the way the world works. You know, a new discovery or a new application of scientific knowledge can, can change the way people operate or the way industries and businesses operate. So this may sound pie in the sky, but I'll give you another example from the Farm Bill. So thinking back to that conservation compliance discussion earlier, again started in 1985, and you know, do you really think that if back in 1985 putting those provisions in place would have pushed people off the land, if that would have made farmers go out of business, would we have done it? Absolutely not. There's no way we would have done that. But that wasn't the case, because by 1985, agricultural scientists, in conjunction with lots of really smart farmers and other people, um, had come up with, with techniques and strategies to allow you to farm a hilly slope and not lose all your soil. We come up with things like no-till. We come up with things like terracing and strip cropping and contour cropping. So agricultural scientists changed the way the world worked. They made it possible to farm sloping ground without losing all your soil. And because they did that, all of a sudden it made it possible for policymakers to put into place a provision saying you need to control erosion. So that's just one example. But this to me is really powerful. That's the most lasting way I see of having an impact on policy. And that's what I hope to do in my career. That's why I'm here and that's kind of my theory of change for how I think I can help improve agriculture. All right, so those are our three scientist strategies. Um, some concluding thoughts before we have questions. How do I evaluate this farm bill? So I'm really torn. And I remember earlier I said that I'm a bit of a perfectionist. So as a perfectionist or an idealist, it's really hard not to conclude that the Farm Bill is just a boondoggle. Uh, you know, it's, it's a waste of government money. It doesn't make sense. There's all these inconsistencies. Um, you know, if you were a benign dictator and you could just write it yourself, it would be so much better. Um, but that's not actually reality. So 
the realist in me who's been through a little bit of it and has watched it from afar since then knows just how much work went into this and how many people dedicated themselves and made themselves sick and didn't take vacations, didn't take weekends over years to make this happen and made positive improvements, made things better in this farmable than they were in the past. And I think most of the time that's how policy moves forward. Incrementally, step by step, people come up with something new, fight for it, and it, it gets a little bit better. So I don't want to conclude that it's a boondoggle. I want to conclude that it's about the best farm bill that we could have gotten. But I'll leave it to you all to decide whether you're an idealist or a realist and on your own determine you know, what your reaction is to this farm bill because I think we need both of those kinds of people in the long term to, to make those incremental changes and then every once in a while when the conditions are right to make a big change that really moves us forward. So you'll notice that I haven't really given the overview of what happened in the farm bill and that was intentional because I think it might have bored you to tears if I had gone through slide by slide what happened. Um, but I'm hoping that there's a lot of time left um, and uh, I also want to make the offer now that if there's some very specific program that you depend on for funding or you just really care about and you don't understand what happened to it, send me an email. Um, my email's on the next slide and I'll try to figure out what happened. So with that, thank you and I'll be happy to take any questions that you have.